So I'll start with the introduction. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for being here today. We got, we've gotten a great response for these uh, for this lecture series, and uh, I'm very very happy to see everyone coming out at this time as well. Uh, we're trying to kind of manage our time zone to make sure participants from various countries can join in based on their interests. So before talking about today's talk, uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ria, and I am a teacher and a research associate at Nirman. I will be moderating today's session. Uh, this is our fourth edition of the monthly Nirman lecture series. So every month we hope to bring out at least two to three lectures uh, from an academic field about education, about childhood in India, about parenting, about teaching. So keep a lookout. Uh, if you have already signed up for the lecture, which is why you're here, so you will get an email for our, for our next lecture series as well. And uh, thank you for joining again for today's uh, for this lecture series, which is the politics of childhood. Uh, I have been a teacher at Nirman. So I teach social studies and English. And of course, I've taught primary to uh, middle school. And the different kinds of children that you interact with every, every day is so vast. Like, of course, there is not one particular idea of a child that there is. And there are multiple childhoods that are uh, there. And what I like about this particular lecture series is about I get the opportunity to explore that idea. Uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about today's lecture. Uh, our topic today is how the history of India has shaped our understanding of the ch of childhood and the child. Uh, Professor Nita Kumar will take us through her research and analysis of different childhoods that have existed in India throughout the course of history and how our ideas are predominantly shaped by uh, our ideas of childhood are predominantly shaped by the middle, our middle class introduction that you know a lot of people receive or have it's a popular introduction that happens across childhood but that is not the case and how there are there's multiple varieties and there's multiple intersections to that so today's lecture will be talking a little bit about that uh, before we begin the lecture, I would like to give you a bit, I would like to talk a bit about Nirman and also about our speaker today. Uh, so yeah, Nirman is a not-for-profit organization. We are based out of Varanasi district. Uh, we work in the city as well as 12 adjoining villages. Uh, we have two schools and uh, Nirman started uh, work in 1990, so that's 30 years of working in education, arts, music research. Uh, we run uh, two innovative school branches. Uh, we are called Vidyashram, the South Point School. So our first campus is in the city. Our second campus is in the Pitavar village, which is 10 kilometers from Banaras. Uh, ours is an integrated school uh, where we have students from diverse backgrounds in all the classrooms. So students from families of weavers, farmers, daily wage workers, uh, academicians, entrepreneurs, researchers, they're all, uh, you know, Kind of sitting together, studying together. So that is what we mean by integrate. Uh, we also run a research wing called the Center for Post-Colonial Education. Uh, we host study abroad students from universities around the world and invite collaboration from educators and artists in different fields. Of course, this has taken a big dent this year due to COVID-19. But if you know if you know someone and if you know a university who would like to do this online, uh, please get in touch with us. Um, through our, uh, our third uh, section of the organization, Nirman, is the artist studio. So we collaborate with artists from various backgrounds of music, martial arts, theater. Uh, when you know, schools were functional, our school calendars were filled with these projects and programs throughout the year. And I think that is something I miss a lot right now. Uh, now let me just uh, quickly introduce today's speaker and then hand it over to her. Um, uh, she's known as Neeta Ma'am to most of us at Nirman, uh, but she's Professor Kumar, Professor Neeta Kumar as well. Uh, she has she completed her PhD from the from University of Chicago. Her fields of research have been history of modern India, anthropology, as well as Russian and European history. Uh, she taught at the University of Chicago, Brown University, and the University of Michigan, amongst other places. Um, and she's, of course, the founder and director of Nirman. So for the past 30 years, she has taught, she has written the curricula, she has designed and trained teachers. Uh, she's worked on children's books and art projects at Nirman. Uh, she's also written multiple books and research papers. 
and also presented her research at multiple places. Uh, she recently retired. Uh, uh, before that, she used to take uh, courses in South Asian history, gender, Bollywood over the years. Uh, and uh, she's devoted her, a lot of her time to just train teachers, train staff members at Nirman, and not just at Nirman, but train uh, anyone who's working in education from different uh, schools, different organizations. So we have had students from BLA departments come over at Nirman, or we have gone there and trained them. Students from Miranda House, Lady Shri Ram College, uh, even international groups such as Lewis and Clark College, University of Washington, Columbia University, and uh, many, many more. Uh, before I keep speaking more, I would like to uh, now invite Nita Ma'am to introduce and start today's lecture. Just a small note before I stop. Um, we will have a question and answer round after the talk. So the talk will go on for 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will have a question and answer round for 8 to 15 minutes. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box at any point. I will take them in a serial, in a serial order. Thank you. So um, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation that I want to have about ch children. And um, as Ria just mentioned, it's in two parts. So I have sort of divided it. I, and I'm deliberately not going to talk about religion, which means a lot of things to do with history also. So for instance, Ria said I'm going to look at different periods of history. And actually, I'm not going to look at ancient India because the Vedic period and the Upanishads and the Buddhist period and the classical Mauryan period and the Gupta age and all that, all those are to do um, very specifically with Hinduism. And there'll be lots of time to uh, focus on that tomorrow. Please join me again. Um, but uh, today I'm going to talk about definitely about history. However, let me begin by saying something about children. I always like to say that if you're going to talk about children, let's evoke them right in the beginning. Um, um, yeah, so children have many enemies, right? Who are the enemies? I, I wish I could really see you all and interact with you more. That's what I prefer, but maybe later we will have this conversation. So um, if the children are low caste, it's upper caste people. If the children are girls that we are talking about, it's going to be the patriarchs, whether men or women. If they are poor, then it's the privileged people and the privileged families and the children of privileged families. Um, but all children have one enemy in common, and that is adults. That's you and I and all of us. So whether they are poor or rich, girl or boy, whichever caste they are, a child, by virtue of being a child, is on one side of the fence. And on the other side is everyone who is past childhood, who has grown up and have forgotten their childhood or lost touch with it or in different ways have turned their back to it and simply have grown up. And that's adults. So when we are talking as authorities about um, childhood and the child, I want to be humble and say that there are actually no representatives of the group that we are talking about amongst us, right? It seems like uh, something that will bring a smile to people's faces. How can there be a child amongst us? But think about it. I mean, in many other fora, if you are talking about some group or the other, there is at least a token representative from that group. So, um, but let me tell you my resolution of the problem. I spent the day today in teaching uh, two classes. I planned an activity for children out in the fields. I shot a video after teaching some acting to some children. And then I took a music class and did a lot of sargam and exercises with uh, some other children. So I immersed myself with children the whole day in order to be in the right mindset to talk about the child. And as Ria mentioned, um, this is my passion. I am trying, have been trying for some decades to educate a few hundred children, not thousands at all by any means, but a few hundred children, some of whom are extremely underprivileged, but not all. Some are perfectly secure and well off. And the whole idea is that there should be um, a characterizing of children, 
not simply by their background of caste, class, or religion, but to give them an understanding of and respect as children. So the bottom line of the child should be that they are a child, not that they are a certain kind of child and therefore different to other kinds of children. So anyway, this is the, the particular perspective I have on childhood and children. And I would say that my 30 year experience has, I think, borne some results. But at any rate, even though I'm not the best uh, director of the best organization in the world, I want to make this conversation worthwhile and I'm very happy to have you all join me. And I am a historian, so uh, I have been, you know, even longer meddling around with history and different historical questions and issues. And usually you might find this interesting. I argue that history is being given too much weight in our political life and that we should let it rest and we should enjoy history as just a foreign country. That means a travel to a different place, a different time and a completely different society and culture and narrative. And that we should try to dig up as much as we can in order to understand and be sensitive to as much as we can of something that is radically different to our present situation. That's the real virtue of history, that it tells you something which you don't know, that it takes you somewhere else where you don't belong, right? And sometimes it can be just actually the opposite of what you are living and experiencing right now. So it's not that history should be somehow responsible for everything in the present and that it should answer every single question we have, every single need we have. It's not as if if you're going to do something today, the answer lies in the past and that's where we should first turn. So, yes, we are products of our history, but do you know that we don't actually know that history well enough to be able to understand what kind of products we are of what exactly kinds of processes there were? So, uh, although my take on history is that we should not meddle with it too much in answer to present day problems, today I'm reversing my own chosen perspective and I'm going to argue that we cannot actually run schools or do anything which is just and fair for children, unless we are familiar with the historical explanation of our present perspective on the child, right? So please take what I say with this uh, sort of uh, qualification that I do not maintain that history is the answer to all our problems. I'm just saying that it's very, very, very useful to look at the historical background of many of our ways of thinking about children, okay? Uh, I spent yesterday in preparation uh, for this lecture by watching a few movies. And one of them was called I Am Kalam. I hope you've seen it. It's a very feel-good movie, as they say. And it's actually even publicized as uh, morally uplifting or something like that. But it's very uh, interesting. And that's why I was glued to it for the whole length of it. Because it reflects one of the problems that we should be aware of with regard to children in India. Now, um, the, as at least both Hollywood, now with Hollywood, I should evoke the title of Slumdog Millionaire, which was of course famous because it won many awards and all that. And maybe you've seen it, it's quite a bad movie actually. Excuse me for uh, saying that, but uh, between the two of them, what you have is this uh, very typical representation of Indian childhood, which is that they are, uh, mired in some kind of poverty and squalor, that they are uh, a problem, a symptom, a disgrace, maybe some kind of a puzzle to be solved or a question to be answered. But whatever it is that they are, there is still this squalor or this uh, area which has to be characterized by uh, in various problematic ways. So in short, I have yet to see a movie in which we can see our children in India as normal, ordinary, everyday, just, just leading their lives as people with a whole lot of complexity to them and not primarily characterized by their poverty and the lacks that they experience. This is exactly going to the heart of the problem of Indian children because this view of children comes uh, from our history. And by that, I do not mean the ancient period or the medieval period. I'm talking about present day times, the last two to 300 years. 
Literally, the British colonial period is what I'm talking about. Ever since the world was divided up into East and West, the colonizer and the colonized, the backward and the developed, we have developed a certain kind of mindset with regard to the world and with regard to all the inhabitants of the world. What happened? What happened in this period? Why am I making such huge dramatic generalizations? Well, what happened was that thanks to various technological and ideological differences, Britain managed in the 18th and 19th centuries to establish a rule in India that was not primarily based on military control, but what is today known as soft power, right? So that Indians actually believed that there was something very desirable that Britain had, which they didn't. And this uh, included well-dressed, well-disciplined, school-going, uh, getting ready to rule children. Um, many of you may have had the experience, or maybe, I don't know if you're too young or what, uh, you can tell me later. But when I was growing up, I was actually fed on a lot of children's literature, which gave substance to this view, because it was all produced either by people in England or those who were products of that kind of socialization. And I've tried to actually show that uh, worldview so uh, we are making a film, and that's called Shankar's Fairies. And it's going to be finished in just a few months. And that depicts the world of a little girl. It's actually autobiographical. So it's about me when I was uh, seven or eight or nine years old. And, uh, but I've tried to fictionalize it and show the world uh, of a child growing up in India when India was totally dominated by British and Western ideology, so that what this girl grows up to uh, feed on is all those short stories and images about actually British children, European children. And they have nothing to do with the India all around. They have nothing to do with village India, small town India, the countryside, the traditions, the culture, nothing at all. Now, this is what happened. Uh, I'm talking about the 60s in this film, but forget about that for now. What, this is what happened in 19th century India. So the impact of colonialism went deep into our psyche, deep, profoundly deep into it. And the uh, reflection of that is a feeling of deficiency so that you realize, oh, I'm not like them. I'm not like the people I adore or I respect or I like or I follow all the time and I think about and in some cases I dream about, right? So. Uh, um, the colonized Indians were, of course, uh, not all the same. So there were metropolitan Indians, such as in Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. And there were middle class Indians, those becoming middle class. And they, among them was, you know, some fairly upper class Indians. And all of these people could actually uh, construct a lifestyle in which they lived out this dream or this idea, which was a reflection of the British idea of the self and the family. And they could do that, but they only had to somehow wall themselves off or separate themselves off from everything that existed around, which of course was like a mirror of themselves, but a distorted mirror. So they could see poor and malnutritioned, ignorant and filthy children, adults also, but children all around them. And this was not them, right? So you, um, there's a lovely anecdote about Sayyid Ahmed Khan, if you, if you know who that is, one of our prime educators in modern India. And Sayyid Ahmed Khan was an elite person. He was a, a man of the gentility. And when he was extremely well-educated, erudite, and on top of you know, the ruling class and all that, when he went to England, and this is how it hits people. You, you're familiar with Gandhi's example, but let me tell you about Sayyid Ahmed Khan. When he went to England, that's when he realized that he was just a native as far as the British people were concerned. And the book that he had to look at, which was titled The People of India, was a book in which he couldn't see anyone like him. It was all half-clad, ill-clad, tribal people, poorest of the poor, farmers, peasants, anyone that the particular British ethnographer or photographer who wanted to represent India as being the stark opposite of Britain chose to put into that book. And there was nothing Sayyid Ahmed Khan could do or anyone else in his position 
to separate himself from these people. People of India means the people of India. You can't say, well, well I am a person of India, but I'm not them. Well, we try to do that, but it's not really possible. One way out is what Salman Rushdie does in Midnight's Children. If you're familiar with that book, and now it's out as a movie on Netflix, so of course, your speaker today has watched that as well. Um, I have a lot of recommendations for movies, so ask me anytime. But in Midnight's Children, he creates um, a double. So there's a rich boy and a poor boy, Salim Sinai and Shiva. And both are born at exactly the same moment. And guess what? The nurse exchanges them so that they grow up in each other's families. And if you, if you were old enough to remember, if you watch old Bombay films, that used to be a common device in the past, that somewhere close to birth, the baby was switched and the rich, guy, the rich child and the poor child grew up in each other's families, which, was, which is an artistic way, if you want to think about it, to show how the fates of rich and poor are actually tied up together. You show it as a kind of exchange at birth. What I'm trying to uh, emphasize here is that when people in colonial India realized that there was something desirable, but it was outside their grasp, however, they could imitate it and they could try to live it for themselves, they could never, never tear that part of them out and throw it away, which actually was part of the nation, right? So you can have your own private lives and make them whatever you like. But just as soon as you look over your shoulder, there is someone right there. It's, it's actually there in, in Midnight's Children because there's someone called Wee Willie Winky who is just a kind of beggar performer. And he comes with his little shabby child all the time and faces them. And who amongst us have not had to face people who are begging, people who are poor, people on the roadside, etc. How does one separate oneself from them? Okay, So um, thus the, the uh, situation came around that the Indian child was seen as, um, together with you know, many, many things in India, something to be pitied, something to be rescued from the vices and evils of backwardness. And the vice and the backwardness could be attributed to their families. So the child, of course, is still innocent in a way, up to a certain age. But you can uh, adopt the role of the reformer and therefore say, I'm going to rescue the child. Now, um, what happens with this kind of an attitude is that you tend to inwardly blame the child. Why is the child so backward? Why does his nose run, if you, you know, want to put it that way? Why can't he not enunciate properly? Why is he so naughty and why does he run amok? And why does he want to follow his preferences rather than ours? Ours is very clear. He should be successful in his studies. He should be successful in all the work and activities we have set out for him. And if he only develops in that admirable way, then it's going to work out for us. So what is happening here is instead of seeing the child for the child's own self as an individual, the child has become a symbol of the community. The child has become a symbol of success. We can only show ourselves to be progressive and developed if our children will only listen and do what they have to do. And the problem lies in our colonialism. The problem lies in after independence, the uneven development of our country. It's not the problem of the child. The child is only one little part of the whole setup. And moreover, as such a young thing, the product of whatever we do, whatever we set up for the child. But in India, thanks to this effect of colonialism and the deep uh, inroads it made into our psyche and the way we responded to it, all our nationalist leaders, all our reformers, we responded by targeting for reform the child, first of all. We didn't look at adults as much as we looked at the child. All right, so what am I saying? I'm saying that it's a problem of modernity. I think every nation has a modernity that is born out of something in their history. In the case of India, it's not like in France, there's not a revolution. It's not like in Denmark or Holland or England, there's not an industrial revolution or urbanization. 
It's not like in America, a new constitution. Our modernity in India is born out of colonialism. And this colonialism is something we both hated and loved. So we think that India is great. And we think its past was greater still. But also in the same breath, we want and we want super fast many, many products and habits which are clearly from other countries and other histories and that even clash with our own heritage. But rather than negotiate all that, and I'm saying it's all negotiable, I don't think there's a binary opposition or anything like that. Rather than deal with it head on, we hide the contradictions under the surface and the child is at the heart of it. We know perfectly well if you were to sit down and discuss it, that this idea of the child, the precious child as it's called in the literature, and childhood was quote unquote discovered in only in the mid 18th to the 19th centuries in Europe. Before that, even the Europeans did not have a notion of the child as a separate individual entity and rather only as a property of the community. So this happened because of industrialization, urbanization and various revolutions and the coming of modernity in Europe. We want to be modern and we are striving for it, but we have not made that discovery yet of the precious child and the preciousness of childhood. And maybe we shouldn't. I'm not saying that that's the way to go. I'm not saying at all that we are now, you know, as it's called in that same historical process and we should soon follow on that. But we have to at least negotiate with it. We have to discuss it. We cannot keep blaming uh, some kind of uh, group pointing our fingers to them for the failure of not being that or expecting the child to deliver the goods to us. Let me take a quick uh, detour here just to tell you a little bit about the historiography of the subject, what historians are doing about this. So there are two clear sides in the history writing on the child. So one is very sturdy and very solid. It's very painstaking, very well documented. And it's a history of the growth of rights for the child. And this takes the two forms. One is about uh, the, the working conditions for the child, the, the rights of the worker. And one is about sexuality. So how the age for child marriage was raised you know, periodically. So it went up from a remarkable you know, 8 and 12 to 14 to 16 with a lot of controversy and a lot of conflict and related subjects such as permission for child widows to remarry or for child um, marriages when, when the uh, girl became an adult to not cohabit with their husbands if they didn't wish to, uh, how divorces were possible. So all of these are within this approach of history writing. So here the um, underlying assumption is that we should be modern, we need to be modern, we need to have the same kinds of rights as, for instance, in the UN, United Nations um, um, Charter for Children's Rights, which you know gives a universal definition of what is a child and what is a child's rights. So that kind of thing is what we have to uh, trace in the history of India. This is one approach, OK? The other approach is, uh, as was mentioned already, that childhood is multiple, that this is only one side of the story about how progress was achieved. But there's a whole other side about when progress was not achieved, right? So we have lots of children who are vagrants and homeless and often then neglected in different ways. And um, history writing is actually quite rich on this group, which is surprising. But that's because, if you know, historians need archival records, and there is a lot of archival data on these kinds of efforts, reforms, and institutions. Now, when I set this up, and I talk about the things that worked and were done in favor of children uh, in Indian history writing, and those uh, things that were not done, so there's a record of you know working class children and all those kinds of children also, what I'm suggesting is that we are leaving out a whole history, which is extremely difficult to document. There are almost no archival records. And this would be the history of children who are leading normal everyday lives rooted in their homes. And homes are, of course, diverse. Some could be broken homes or one parent homes, etc. So there is a whole other side in which the 
child should not be just a problem okay the child has his or her own individuality own life narrative and a very rich complex history which is not covered yet in our history writing their histories are not written and what exists are mostly the histories of children seen as problems which is a good thing if you don't even do that we are not going to get anywhere at all but i'm purposely underscoring not what has been done which is a lot of good histories and i can name them for you afterwards but the existing gaps in it all right where we need to think about and uh, attack it more coming back to what i was saying about modernity all right so this was a little tangent about the historiography now what is it that i'm saying about i'm i'm suggesting that our our um, situation is uh, useful in historical terms if we choose to think about the discourse of childhood in india today and by that i mean the discourse of modernity which is also reflected in childhood so what is our understanding of modernity in india or anywhere for that matter what is modernity so the first thing and the most important thing i would say is citizenship in a modern context uh, one puts the self above the community at the same time the self is bound by a compact to other selves so that there is an exchange of responsibilities towards the state and society and in exchange for certain rights right so this bondage is attended by a lot of freedom so individuals feel free but of course a citizen is caught in all kinds of legal and other obligations and this is very very specific in modern societies um the second facet of modernity is technology and so in any modern state there must be a certain kind of infrastructure to supply the promised rights to citizens and this includes education the third is consumerism um modernity is helped a lot supported almost in every society by capitalism and the markets reinforce the message of modernity individualism agency choice etc all through consumption and the desire leading to consumption but this kind of capitalist desire and consumption does promote individualism agency and choice so here's what you have citizenship technology consumerism do we have those in india well we have technology to some extent but with much limitations we have consumerism galloping ahead no question and we have citizenship as a problem area i'll just come back to that but the fourth aspect which is very interesting to me is performance you have to perform modernity you can't be quiet about it right for instance in america no one who is a millionaire thinks that they are actually the same as the poor man on the street they don't but they have elaborate rituals and gestures of speech and behavior to demonstrate that they are right so they perform equality and in order to actually push on ahead with the modernity that is there on paper you are going to have to perform it and the more you perform it the truer it becomes you actually believe it when americans smile broadly and they will always seem pleasant and they talk to you nicely and there's lots and lots of sorries excuse me is thank yous please it's not false i'm not saying performance meaning false i'm just saying that they have been socialized and educated and trained themselves to see it all as necessary and therefore true now in india we do perform modernity but it clashes so hard with our technology the limitations of our technology and with the limitations of our citizenship we perform it only in the consumerist mode a good example is at present during covid times we are all pretending that our smartphones are the answer to everything right that's what i would say instead of openly acknowledging that most indians are brethren our fellow citizens don't actually have the requisite technology either even smartphones or internet or some in some cases electricity 
or they don't even have the ability to consume it were it even provided which it's not and therefore that there is a failure of the state to either provide the infrastructure or the education towards requisite uh, consumption of modernity towards requisite citizenship so uh, this is um, the overall discourse that i want to um, unpack a little bit more you may be wondering why i have not talked about two or three other things which are also attendant problems so before pushing on with the favorite one of mine of modernity let me talk about these three other problems caste gender and class now caste uh, consists of two things related to education one is that of course it's a very powerful socialization but in most cases it's totally insular no family no family including the most um, let's say emancipated family actually thinks of themselves as anything but the best right that's the nature of the family no family acknowledges the superiority of another or will teach their children to adequately respect the other that's in part of the nature of the socialization of caste now it does have its uh, pros which is that there is a lot of continuity in indian culture and some very useful ethics and morals and so on are passed on at the site of the family but the other problem is that we still have discrimination in fact now we have probably a little bit more than we had a few decades ago and in the absence of other discourses which are submerged uh, caste continues to have a certain amount of legitimacy which is not legal which is not correct so when you want to label a child as failing shockingly enough you call them by their caste names um when i'm doing research among ordinary schools i often hear the terms neech kaum ke hain choti jaat ke hain without any awkwardness on the part of the speaker and uh, the principal or the teacher who says this can also use the same terms with regard to each other as long as it's outside the hearing this is very thinly disguised and it's very shocking but really we have to ask why does caste still enjoy this kind of a status in our society we should have the bravery the courage to actually dismiss it again and again and again now with regard to children it's particularly important because of the socialization effect once a child is labeled in a certain way it will be very difficult for us to get it out of their systems it's not merely that one teacher has made a mistake it's it's a very very major mistake that's being made on the part of everyone who is part of this discourse of uh, modern india uh, in the case of gender we have to be very aware that almost nothing we say for children is actually the same for boys and girls girls need to be looked at separately in themselves um there is a novel called mai which i translated from the hindi to the english it's about a brother and sister growing up right from early childhood to adulthood and the reason why i love that novel and i chose to translate it and i recommend it to all of you it's still in print is because it shows the difference that occurs for the girl and the boy and that for the girl it's all about the body i mean for the boy it's very rarefied very abstract he has all kinds of uh, thoughts and ideas and you know he flies off free and does whatever he likes but for the girl it's all about how she should dress how she should behave how she should move around where she can go where she cannot go what she can choose to do and who can be her friends now this is not again a separate sphere that we don't need to look at it's all about childhood itself and uh, much as we like to sing praises of the past and we'll talk more about that tomorrow what we need to do historically is to actually look at this horrible <clears throat> excuse me absence of girls and women and of course of the rights uh, of girls and women in the past at the same time there is no 
point in celebrating the present as extremely progressive. What one needs to do is to stop looking at the past uh, with our own political priorities. But, you know, as I'm going to put it in an odd way, but search for the submerged, quote unquote, feminism, if I might use that term, even in different eras of the past. So there is a lot of um, uh, oppression. There's a lot of inequality. But at the same time, there is always a struggle in favor of getting more rights, in favor of more equality. It's not that we modern people have only now started doing it and no one else had that idea. There's been some version of it throughout history. And that, again, is another area of history that's not been much documented. We have excellent historians who have looked at girlhood and the experience of uh, girls growing up. And uh, they, again, like most historians, have resorted to the uh, archival data that exists. So it's mostly about girls of a certain family background, right? More privileged, more elite. What we need to do is to find, hone our historical um, tools in order to be able to find in our past some evidence of what we are interested in in the present. So if you're interested in difference and inequality, let's look for that. And if you're interested in the efforts that were made to cope with that and overcome it, there is plenty of it. You know, I'm just throwing out one hint. For instance, Buddhist nuns in the before the common era have written poetry, which is worth looking at. And they were singing about agency, choice, and individualism in those poems. Um, and then there's class. So in a, a modern society, it's not that class doesn't exist and people are actually equal. Modern constitutions promise equality. Everyone is equal as a citizen. And there are lots of opportunities to make this successful. But the job of a modern society is to provide institutions, and specifically educational institutions, that can overcome given class barriers. So in all developed countries, it's been the schools that have been able to promote uh, more and more social mobility. What we have in India is the biggest problem of all, which is that there is a cycle that people are not able to get out of. If your parents are poor, then it's not going to be possible to do that, that Abraham Lincoln thing. Yeah, if you've heard of what Abraham Lincoln was, um, maybe in the past we had people, I believe that Rajendra Prasad, who was the first president of India, also studied in a village school, just like Lincoln did. The difference is that Lincoln's family uh, was very uh, rural and very uh, ill-educated. I don't think they were very well-educated people. And uh, Rajendra Prasad's family were probably already educated. So he was not a first generation learner. And this is important because the main problem in India, which is historically derived but very, very pressing today, is that we have no way of dealing with first generation learners. This problem of class difference, of inequality, is based, yes, on social and economic premises. But the job of any educational ventures and policies should be to overcome this precisely through education. Some people still are doing it. However, the numbers are nowhere close to the numbers that should be the result of properly conducted educational institutions. Um, the underlying ideology here, or discourse here, seems to be that it's, there is a, an essence without, within people. That's what caste is about, right? It's an essential trait, set of traits, which uh, decide what kind of a person you are. Well, even those who don't think consciously about caste and don't use any terminology related to caste, they actually think in terms of essences. So that when a child is showing any natural childlike quality, such as, say, the ability to climb trees, we have 
such a child, of course, in our school, or to fly kites very well, but a lack of a similar ability to, say, learn a poem or read a passage. It's not that we will think about it specifically in the ways that I've described, that he is good at certain things, he needs to be helped in other things. Immediately, the adult in India is going to fall into the trap of essentializing the child as being oh from a certain kind of background. And guess what? Of course, the child is from a certain kind of background. The child is rural, maybe a one parent family, right? No one to look after that child or give support at home. And an uneducated parent's body, right? So first generation learner from a poor family without adequate middle class kind of support at home. These are characterizations that we make. I'm speaking of it very analytically. People just jump into the characterization and say, of course, that child is going to be like this. They already seem to know the result of that child's uh, efforts and career in school. So we are failing horribly, our children. And we are doing that only because of the kind of education we have set up. We have set up a very interesting format, which could be called the box of modern education, right? But within it, what we are doing is we continue to give children um, certain very limited resources and limit te limited technologies. We are not being fair or just to them. We are not giving them what is needed for that thing to work. And then we label them failures. You know, it's like saying, um, here's something, offering it, then withdrawing it, and saying, oops, you don't have it. Or creating certain things for them, which is, uh, say, a platform on which they're not going to be able to stand, they're going to slip and fall, and then say, oh, you weren't able to stand at all. Look at that. That's how stark it is. OK, let me end by saying that, of course, there are, there are children who are very nicely supported by their families, who are being able to do very well in school. However, those children are not being fully actually supported because they, in these privileged schools of theirs, are being uh, separated from their environments in a very crucial, in a very highly political way. Uh, in all the elite schools that I've researched and looked at, one thing which was very interesting was the discouragement of different ways in which they could potentially have bridged the gap with their environment. For example, the learning of Indian languages. That's a, the simplest way. And uh, we are coming now to a problem of language teaching, I guess. But the way that English is promoted in these schools is by discouraging the whole world out there, which is made accessible through their own languages of India. So we are developing a class when they become adults, these same children, a class of leaders in India who, again, are unable to understand their own childhood. They think that they are special as children without understanding that there is a class divide between their kind of families and the kind of provisions and which are made for families that are different, right? I, as opposed to other lectures, I have not given my children and my examples names this time. I'm just keeping starkly to the prose without telling you too many narratives. But I hope it's coming alive to you. Um, as I said, I wanted to end by asking who is to blame? Am I blaming the teachers when I'm quoting them as using certain kinds of terminology? Am I blaming policymakers? Am I blaming the administrators? If I'm saying that we have a certain colonial legacy of childhood, we have a certain definition of modernity, which is the real problem in our, in our way of dealing with children, who am I ascribing these problems to? My um, usual answer to that question is to say, it's you and me. It's the people who are interested in children, childhood, and education. The people who are attending webinars, who are reading and writing and discussing these topics. The kind of members of the educated classes who are working on anything to do with children, childhood, and education. It's we who need to 
push all this further. That's why I keep emphasizing the topics that need research, the kind of questions that need more attention. So um, I don't think I would ever say it's the British to blame, nor would I say it's the Indian nationalists or leaders. They both played you know, various important roles. But what you should know about history is that people often do things which are not directly connected to the results. So the results which we have today was not what they planned or plotted, and therefore we have to blame them for it. The results are in our hands. At the most, we have to unpack them, deconstruct the processes that led to them. And now we have to face it from scratch and realize that it's our own lethargy or you know some kind of limitations. They include all kinds of limitations. I mostly stress educational limitations in my own case, for instance. My own darned school did not teach me to pay enough attention. So by the time I reached a certain ripe old age and started paying attention to these questions, you know, a lot of years had flown down the drain. And we could do that at earlier ages, right? As is being done in places like the new Azim Premji University, for instance. OK, so we have to share ways to share information with each other, to discuss and debate more to put this on the public agenda, to make more people aware of it, more people worried about it, right? May this continue. Thank you very much for joining. And I look forward to answering some of your questions right now. Uh, thank you, you so, okay, thank you so much for that uh, talk. There was a lot of uh, comments that were coming in while the talk was going on as well about how, how people resonated with uh, the points that you were making. And, uh, so I'll quickly jump to the questions. Just before that, uh, we might exceed our session by 10 minutes. Uh, and instead of closing at 7.30, uh, I would like to close at 7.40. Please, uh, I would request you to stay. Of course, if you can. If not, uh, you will have the recording, lect lecture recording to view. Uh, so the first question, I'll start with a few basic questions to clarify. Um, this is by uh, Mr. Abdul. That, uh, how much? Uh, can we generalize these observations uh, on all, like on an India level? Uh, is there any kind of uh, regional variation to childhood and the variation? So that is the first question. Uh, the second one is by Ruhi. And the question is, just like a child can be described from the lens of modernity, how different would the description be when looked at from a post-modernist lens? Uh, would you like to take one more question or should I stop here? Go ahead with one more. Okay. Uh, this one is by Janvi. Uh, where could we find the beginning of the so socialization and where do we see ourselves in the future without it? So I think the socialization of childhood and how should we begin with it and how do we see childhood uh, form making, creating our futures, like our ideas of childhood uh, forming our ideas of future. Is how I have understood this question. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, the very interesting question about uh, generalization versus regional specificities. Um, I, uh, you know, as all historians and anthropologists do, I work on a very specific locality. You know, my chosen area of research is just the city of Banaras, not even outside it. Um, and the, the risk in every case is, when people, when they do history, when they do anthropology, sociology, they have to be very, very specific and talk about one locality, one group, or one whatever. Uh, the risk is uh, that they may not be able to generalize. And since I do want to generalize, then I rely a lot on secondary literature. And I pop around, literally. I love to travel, so I go around to 10 different states and spend maybe a month in Rajasthan, which is what I did. Uh, a couple of months in Uttarakhand, it's cooler and nicer. Uh, and Goa, it's nice also. And sometime in West Bengal and Bihar, and you know, and thus and Delhi. So I have visited all these states and looked at their schools. Enough. You can't do the same kind of research, but you can, between the secondary literature and some touch with both the places and people themselves and interacting with the scholars of those places you can come to some kind of acceptable generalizations. Otherwise, you should not generalize. You should always qualify what you are saying 
by saying, this is where my data is from. And it's in someone else's hands then to either agree or disagree with it or to show it to be true or false. That's the nature of research. So as a researcher, and my recommendation to you is always be very specific. And if you want to generalize, do these two, three things that I su suggested since I did want to generalize. And then lay yourself out as being accountable to other researchers who can then you know, qualify what you're saying with other data that they might have better than you have. Um, how about the lens of modernity uh, through a postmodern lens? Well, to tell you a little secret, I was actually using a postmodern lens because when you start questioning modernity like that, instead of taking it for granted as normal, natural, and universal, and therefore unanalyzable, um, that's when you are within modernity. I'm not within it. I'm looking at it as a kind of box from the outside. And uh, to use terms, some of which I did, like discourse or deconstruct, that already gives you a hint that I'm using a postmodern lens. And a postmodern lens is, uh, very simply speaking, almost simplistically speaking, to try to ask about the things that modernity doesn't take into account. So if you're talking about the modern constitution of India, to ask who is it leaving out or what, what part of its terminology is such that it's not acceptable to some people or it's not going to be ever followed by some people? Or how does it even reach people? You know, these are all postmodernist kinds of questions. Or I hope I did that in the case of caste and gender and class. So my uh, lenses are hopefully postmodern, but I also want to promote it. So even if they fall short of it, you all should go ahead and use postmodern lenses. It will just be a way of interpreting and analyzing modernity. We can't choose the kind of society we live in. We are living in a society that's laboring and struggling to be modern. All right. But you could be a postmodern thinker within that construct of modernity. I have, a, I have an article. I'm going to post the link to it. It's called uh, a post modern, no, a post-colonial school in a modern world. It's about the school that um, I'm partly responsible for. And uh, it was published in EPW, Economic and Political Weekly, uh, quite some time back, I think 2003 or four, a post-colonial school in a modern world. So it tells you how India is modern, but how you could run um, plans and programs for children in a postmodern way. Uh, our, whole school, our whole school is hopefully postmodern or trying to be. Socialization, where does it begin and where does it end? Is that the question? Um, where does it begin and then how do we see our future through it? Like how we are socializing our children? How, do, how does that form our future? Yeah, and so um, it's a very, very uh, treacherous and dangerous territory because you are not always actively socializing children, right? Um, children are dependents, and even if they are independent with an agency of their own, which they have right from birth, at the same time, they are learning so quickly and so thoroughly from everything around them that you can never be innocent of influencing them. And influence is another word for socialization. Whatever you do, whatever they're observing you do, over, they overhear you saying, and so on, even if it's not directly directed at them, are all means of socializing children, right? So I said it's risky because you can never be right, right? You're always going to be a fault, faulted individual. You'll have so many shortcomings of your own. I planned when I first had my children, when they were small, I thought, oh, I'm going to do this great thing and socialize them into being, you know, like the kind of Indians uh, such as I respect, but I never had the socialization to become. But my mind was sort of a blank. I wasn't completely sure how to do that. You know, I had vague images of reading aloud from the Ram Charit Manas or <laughs> celebrating every festival or, uh, you know, taking them all around India so they could savor their country. And all those things we did to some extent. But you know, how is it 
that good. You know, there's so much left. And now that I have a grandchild, I'm thinking a little bit <laughs> about what the things I didn't do with my children and could be done with her. So socializing is always there. Socialization is always there. That's the, the, both the power of it and the trouble with it. And it's a whole rival system to education. It doesn't stop until you know adulthood. And sometimes it continues after that. So uh, in another uh, movie which I just watched, uh, which is called The uh, Fortunate Man, it's a Danish movie. The whole thing is about how this brilliant architect and engineer couldn't achieve his dreams because of his childhood socialization. His parents had such a power over him that to the end of his day, he dies in the movie. He's not able to do whatever he wishes to because of that kind of socializing. So there's no end to it. And the only uh, relief, if that's the right term we can have for it, is to very, very creatively and constructively build up in our schools certain kinds of strategies and techniques, all very child-friendly and child-centered, that could be a match for the family socialization. I would love to discuss this more, but let's go ahead for now. Uh, thank you for sharing. So uh, we have gotten a request to share the movie recommendations uh, that you've been very okay. uh, really giving out <laughs> and uh, notes we will add uh, the daily suggestions and the movie suggestions that were you know put down in the spoken in the lecture uh, we do have last three questions to go uh, so first one is uh, what is about transition so a lot of there's a lot of transition from generation to generation and the question is in respect for childhood and womanhood both uh, so how does it change our ideas of childhood or womanhood? Uh, how does it change the meaning? How our interpretation towards it, it changes because of the transition? Uh, I just want to confirm if I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's audible. I, I just, uh, I'm not completely okay. sure about the question, Ria. Uh, just mm -hmm. let me repeat it. So yeah. uh, through the generations, how do the ideas of... Um, Childhood, womanhood, and childhood. Yeah, what meaning do we make of it over generations to generation? How it changes. So that um, second one uh, might be a bit more detailed, but you can uh, you know answer maybe a little. Uh, it's by Ananya. How do we teach children without letting these biases and essences of caste uh, changing our interactions with the students? And um, the last one being uh, based on a, based on your experiences in history, can you say that any kind of modernization leads to streamlining of non-partisan narratives into a dominant one on an average? And if so, why? Any kind of streamlining? Yeah, any kind of streamlining, which, which is led by modernization. Yeah. And does that lead to non-partisan narratives uh, becoming the dominant narrative, Okay, a, a general trend for it. I'll try to answer them. They are sort of um, complex questions. Yeah. So about um, childhood and womanhood, ideas about childhood and womanhood. I'm very glad you use the term, how do they change, right? You're interested in the changes. Much healthier and much better, correct term, than evolve or develop. Because if you say, how have the ideas evolved or how have they developed, then that savors of one kind of linear progress where you see everything as being uh, deficient in the past and improving gradually generation after generation. And you know, if you know anything about history, that's simply not true. There are so many things that were not, are not progressing in a linear fashion, but going a little bit backwards sometimes. And at any rate, even if it's not forwards and backwards, it's a sort of cyclical. You know, you can, you can move to in a certain direction in one generation and then come back in the next one to the previous generation, right? So it's, it's always different for different things. So in, the, in regards to ideas about womanhood, for instance, historians have found and very well documented this finding 
that uh, in the 19th century, starting from the 18th, when the uh, first the East India Company and then the British uh, Crown took over the rule of India, and they set up their own systems of justice and administration and so on, um, the situation for women went backwards. They, they had less freedom initially under the British than they used to have because the British played around with laws in a way without understanding them, or maybe you know just randomly without caring, uh, which took care, which took away many of the rights that already existed on the ground for women, and made them into some kind of pay limitations of Victorian ladies, whom, as we know, were not very free people. Victorian ladies, my goodness. So, um, depending on what you are looking at specifically. You have to see where something is changing. There's not a law about it. I just want to warn that it's not linear progress. That's very important to know. Even though we want to, of course, celebrate the fact that uh, earlier only a certain number of girls were getting an education, then it increases, then it further increases, and so on. Today, of course, there is relatively more freedom for girls to both move around publicly and including to go to school and all that. However, it's not measurable. So don't just assume that there is a certain kind of change. Yeah. And the second question was about how to prevent children from falling into this trap of caste differences. And, uh, and I would say other kinds of differences also. Because together with caste, caste is just a name for the most part. It has to have its reflection in certain bodily characteristics. So either you look a certain way, that means including in your clothes and your possessions and all that, you know, right? Or uh, you behave a certain way. So there has to be some reflection of it, not just, you know, just uh, the, the name. Um, in pedagogical terms, this is one of the things we have been working on at our school and at our organization. There are many actual classroom strategies uh, to promote this kind of equality you know, in spite of class and caste differences. And in a nutshell, very briefly, I'll say that the main thing is to emphasize differences between children. And when you emphasize them, there will be dozens and scores of differences, of which this will seem only one, like who are your parents or how do they live. But then you go into who has a grandmother, who has three siblings, who has uh, a dog for a pet, who... Um, you know, has seen this, who has done that, who goes here, who likes milk, who likes bread, who likes rice, and blah, 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 who wears this color. You know, if you look at everything under the sun and relate it to the child, there'll be hundreds of differences among children. And then the difference of just caste or class fades into the background. This is just a pedagogical strategy. And about modernity, yes. Modernity and its practice does have this positive kind of result, which is uh, of uniformity, right? So uh, in a modern kind of school, children are expected to be all the same, right from the uniforms, well-named things of attire, to everything else. And that's the virtue of it. You can't easily find a lot of... Um, you called it partisanship. I'm not sure um, if I'm you know, coming close to what you meant. But um, yes, so with all its drawbacks, which are some of the things I touched on, uh, there is this um, move towards uniformity and a kind of uh, homogeneity in society. The caveat here, which I want to emphasize and end with, is that it, it has to be an actuality. It can't be just a pretense that we are doing this on the surface. But really under the surface, you can tell from some other things that are going on about all the differences between the children. If you're going to play this game and have this kind of modern institution with its modern trappings, then at least let it be real. All right? Thank you so much. Look forward to the conversation and let it continue. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We have uh, another lecture tomorrow.
the topic is uh, how hinduism has shaped our understanding of the child so again it's the series it's the same series in the politics of childhood and it's at the same time tomorrow if you have registered you will get an email link about it and thank you so much for joining in today and thank you for staying with us until the end as well uh, we will be sharing the lecture notes and the lecture recording for both the lectures together in the next week see you tomorrow thank you